So there was a Dr. Gil Carvalho who did a fact-checking video on me. So today we're gonna do a fact-checking video on the fact checker. Hey, this is Joel. I'm gonna be doing a fact-checking video on the fact checker who's checking the fact checker. It's actually more of a reaction. Uh, this is Dr. Berg. I, I know of him, obviously. If you don't, he's got like 11 million subscribers. Mostly talks about fasting and ketogenic diets. If you're one of those 11 million subscribers, which it just blows my mind, smash the like button below. The video, original video also has like 8,000 comments in the first few days. So there's a lot of people really passionate about this video. I couldn't help myself. I want to see what it's all about. I'm really hoping it's like a really, really petty YouTube influencer slash doctor, uh, you know, trade off. And it could even turn into a bit of like a wizard battle from Lord of the Rings. So I've got my popcorn. We're going to listen to what's going on and then we'll see. Does it get super petty? Do the knives come out? What's Dr. Berg got to say? So we got a ton of requests from a lot of you guys to comment on this video. Okay, so the first thing he says is there's a ton of you that requested to do a video on one of my videos. Hmm, what, what does my channel have to do with your channel? I'm just curious, like, Gil, can you just maybe show us uh, how many people actually requested? The knives are out. We're gonna focus only on the substance. No ad hominems. I didn't Google him. I don't know anything about him. I didn't go watch a bunch of his other videos for context. Nothing. Because it doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is whether the claims match the evidence. So don't you hate that when you know that there's some bad news coming or some negative things about you coming, but they kind of prep it with, you know, oh, we won't look at his character. We won't, we'll be really nice to him. As someone maybe pushes you underneath the bus. That okay, hurt, that continue. comment where it said it doesn't let's matter. I can tell that hurt. Oh, this is so juicy. The American Heart Association, okay? This is brand new. They said total cholesterol is not significantly associated with heart disease. Okay, that's the new finding. They just found out. Looking at your total cholesterol doesn't really give you a lot of information with in relationship Wait, to predicting heart disease. I don't know what he's talking about. Total cholesterol is not the best marker. It's a dirty marker, but it definitely associates with cardiovascular disease with heart disease. I don't remember any. Look how triggered he is. Look at his little lines eyes twitching. It just doesn't associate. He's so good. Period. Here's the 2018 American Heart Association guidelines. Like he said, population studies suggest optimal total cholesterol levels are about 150. Populations with cholesterol in this range manifest low rates of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Nobody's saying it's the best marker, but this is the opposite of what he's saying. I've read these guidelines. There's nothing in there about total cholesterol not associating, period. Maybe he saw something else and misunderstood it. Uh, is there anything in the description that he links as a reference? Okay, two links to journals. That's good. American Heart Association Journal. That's probably it. Let's click here. All right. Sweet. Um, wait, this is Scientific Advisory for Dietary Cholesterol. No way. So petty. Wizard no battle. Way. Don't tell me this guy's confused. Wow. Wow. Yep. Here's the passage he's referring to. Oh my God. I can almost fear that. I can always no hear the fire building up inside him. Look. Disease risk. <laughs> but this document is the scientific. This is the Poor scientific advisory on dietary cholesterol. I think most people understand the difference, but just in case. All right. So that sounds a little bit staged. He's a comeback. He's a comeback. Less. He's absolutely correct. I did make a mistake. The American Heart Association did not say that, but they did say that the dietary cholesterol is not associated with cardiovascular risk. However, if you take a look at this paper in 2018 entitled LDL cholesterol does not cause cardiovascular disease, a comprehensive review of the current literature under section two, does high cholesterol cause atherosclerosis? And in summary, no association between total cholesterol and degree of atherosclerosis, that stuff that clogs up your arteries. Get so it, this point is correct. American Heart Association did not say that, but another uh, paper did say that. 
So both dietary cholesterol and blood level cholesterol is not associated with cardiovascular risk, more specifically risk for getting atherosclerosis. All right, let's move on. Yes, Particle let's move on. No let's get swinging. Come on. It's just like the ashtray analogy. And they add two more lines of evidence. Okay, well, wait a second. Let's go back to this for a second. Saturated fats in cardiovascular health, current evidence and controversies. This is an editorial piece. It's not an actual study. It's someone talking about the data. And they add two more lines of evidence. Statins, which have a well-established effect of lowering risk, preferentially reduce large LDL. And number two, patients with familial hypercholesterolemia, which is a disease where people have very high cholesterol and very high risk of heart disease. I had to put, they have mainly I had to put large my popcorn LDLs, down for a joke on something. And they are at high risk, indicating that large LDLs are not benign. Okay, the next point he brings up, which is rather a, a long explanation, I'm gonna summarize it because it gets into a lot of additional things, which are a bit complex. But basically the point I was making was that um, you have two different size particles with LDL. You have small dense and you have large buoyant, okay? And I was making I'm a point large buoyant. that the small dense <laughs> were more pathological, they create more oh, problems it matches my hat. than That's the hilarious. Large, buoyant particles. <laughs> and so then he shows several references that it's not true. They're both damaging, especially if you look at the total concentration of LDLs. If that's high, you know, that's going to be a, a bigger problem. But uh, there was two additional studies that I want to show you right now that um, came a little bit later than the one he posted. This one was originally published in 15 February 2021. Small dense, low density lipoprotein, that would be the small dense LDL. Cholesterol is the most atherogenic lipoprotein parameter in the prospective Birmingham offspring study. In the conclusion, it says our data indicate that small dense LDL is the most atherogenic lipoprotein parameter. And then there's one more study I want to show you 2017 small dense, low density lipoprotein, that's LDL, as biomarker for atherosclerotic diseases. So this is the conclusion. The results of the recent study demonstrate that LDL fractions, talking about the low dense versus the um, large buoyant, okay, the two different uh, particle sizes, have different atherogenicity. That means ability to affect the arteries. With the small dense LDL being more atherogenic than the large LDL subfractions, small dense LDL is characterized by the enhanced ability to penetrate the arterial wall that makes it a potent source of cholesterol for the development of atherosclerotic plaque. Importantly, longer circulation times of small dense LDL result in multiple atherogenic modifications of small dense LDL particles in plasma, that's your blood, further increasing its atherogenicity. Now, they just mentioned why the small dense LDL is more pathogenic, because it has the ability to penetrate the deeper walls, as well as having a longer circulation time. The longer that a small dense LDL is exposed Where did you get these graphics from? I guess if you've got 11 million followers, you and can afford some editing data, support. Oxidation going on with the small dense LDL he knows what he's talking small. about. Like, okay, I always am skeptical um, of Berg because he's, uh, that, uh, he's a chiropractor, up was, not a medical uh, this, doctor. This word, but he, we, he obviously does his research. Saying, well, we did this or we're doing that. Um, my first thought was, I thought you were an independent guy who just basically is putting out the message and, and um, had doing videos on various topics. It's not on his YouTube channel. I had to do a little searching. And I suspect it's a, a group that he's a member of. And of course, I'm just guessing, but that's the only group that I could find. So Dr. Gill is a member or a council member of an organization called True Health Initiative. So let's take a look at what this organization is. Plant-based diets for reversing disease and saving the planet. Okay, so Ooh. this is a plant-based organization. All right, let's go down to the Ooh. and take a look at the purpose of this organization and what they do. It's okay, changing policy, changing minds, improving lives. It's vegans. Global coalition of world-renowned experts fighting fake facts and combating false doubts about creating a world free of preventable diseases using the time-honored evidence-based fundamentals of lifestyle as medicine okay so the whole uh, mission is to fight fake facts and uh combat false doubts okay all right so that must be the organization that he's talking about when we're talking about we uh, if we scroll down, we see no beef week challenge. Oh, okay, so this is uh, this is definitely a vegan or vegetarian type um, group. It's the vegans, they're back. Uh, let's take a look at their partners, the True Health Initiative partners. Okay, we have no beef. So I can see very clearly they're against beef. Now, <laughs> if you look at how, how many dare videos they? that I have on 
meat and beef, <laughs> there's a lot. This is so good. I actually am pro beef, right? I tell people to consume beef. Now I see why this fact checking video was created. Dr. Gill also did one on Dr. Eckberg, who also has the same philosophy uh, because we're into the a healthy version of the ketogenic diet. Okay, so now it's all making a lot more sense. So Dr. Gill, if you're watching, um, I just wanna let you know, I did participate in a study involving grass-fed beef and uh, from farmers all over the United States and they submitted their Here beef into the study. Uh, and it was a metabolomic study looking at all these metabolites and comparing grass-fed to grain-fed beef, okay? And uh, about six months after the study, uh, the researcher called me up and said, what are you doing? Uh, I said, what do you mean? He says, take a look at this report. Look at this first graph, total phytochemicals. Phyto stands for plants. Interesting. So you can clearly see the difference between the beef that I submitted for this research project as far as the amount of phytochemicals, plant-based chemicals in the beef. And this was compared to other farmers who had grass-fed and compared to grain-fed. So this was the total phytochemicals. Okay, if we scroll down, we'll take a look at a very specific phytochemical called hippurate, which is a major polyphenol. These typically are antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, and higher levels are associated with improved gut microbial diversity and a lowered risk for metabolic syndrome in humans. Here's another one that was significantly higher, which is an anti-inflammatory metabolite. Here's another one, antioxidant, anti-inflammatory. And take a look at the fatty acid profile. We're looking at the omega-6 to omega-3 ratios. So a lower omega-6 to 3 ratio is typically considered beneficial. Lower levels means a higher abundance of omega-3 fatty acids. Here's another interesting finding, vitamin B3, quite a bit more than the other groups. Here's one that's a bit lower than the others, advanced glycation end products, which is a major negative marker for health. Here's another one, homocysteine, uh, much lower than the other groups which is a beneficial I thing. feel like he's going into this detail so I forget so what the actual question people was. People lump in processed meat with grass-fed, grass-finished beef, like they're the same thing. They're they're filming not, something. And of course, there's not a tremendous amount of research in the area of grass-fed, grass-finished, but that's coming using what's called metabolomic testing so you can really see what's going on with these health markers. Because there is a difference in differentiating going to McDonald's versus getting a really healthy source of beef which is filled with phytonutrients and a lot of other great things, including a lot of great bioavailable protein. So Dr. Gill, if you're watching, just wanna let you know, um, there's a lot of positive things in beef that personally I feel very healthy when I consume it, but I can see that I'm a target for this organization for sure. All right, let's scroll down a little bit further on the True Health Initiative. We have Beyond Meat. All right, the truth about plant-based meats. Okay, I see. So this is definitely supporting plant-based meats and alternative meats, okay? And if we do a search on Dr. Gill's site, you have quite a few videos uh, about imitation meats. What or kind of crazy person eats beyond meat? Lab-grown meat. I have no idea what your thoughts are. I didn't watch these videos, but you definitely talk about these, these products. Now, the president of this organization, uh, Dr. David Katz, is definitely not a fan of keto or any other diet that restricts entire food groups calling them unhealthy or unsustainable. He said that uh, keto is just a false label for some kind of diet that presumably restricts added sugar and refined carbohydrates, which frankly, any good diet does. Cat's low opinion on- You don't keto want to make enemies with the ketos. The nutritional specialist- They're worse the than the vegans. <laughs> joined 24 other top names in the field to rank 35 popular weight loss programs for 2020. Recently put up by the US News and World Report, which is a very credible uh, news organization on being very sarcastic. Here's another article, Toasting 2017 Goodbye with Ketogenic Kool-Aid. This is by Dr. Katz as well. He said the historical case for ketogenesis, denying the body its customary fuel source that glucose is in short supply. And instead, it metabolizes fat preferentially and generates ketone bodies as fuel, uh, resides in starvation. Rather predictably, starvation has profound effects on all aspects of metabolism. The body effectively turns to auto-digestion to sustain itself during the protracted fast. Now, first of all- Isn't that kind of the point? That we we wanna burn fat? Is, is starvation, it's not even fasting. Your body might create autophagy, but it's not gonna go after the muscles until you're actually starving, until you burn up your fat. I mean, this is the way our bodies were designed to store fat to live during times of famine and we didn't have food, so we would burn exactly. fat. So there's a way to do ketosis. You could argue we fasting, wouldn't have been fat your carbs. 100 years ago. The one known benefit of ketogenic diets is for the short-term control of otherwise intractable seizures mostly in certain children. So why would that be a short-term thing if it helped them? And that's the only benefit that you know? Okay. You should go to my website. I have over 7,000 success stories, which you probably won't consider valid, but there's 7,000 people um, that are real testimonials of going on the ketogenic diet and looking at many other benefits. Here's another quote. There are, as noted, short-term studies of 
ketogenic diets. I was hoping for some more fireworks. Benefits. I want to see him really throw some mud. Come on, Dr. Berg. So you just lump everything together. All right, whatever. But this next uh, sentence is quite entertaining. But lest you think short-term improvements in these markers, a good idea makes, consider these other interventions that do the same. A bout of cholera, a crack cocaine binge, the spread of cancer through one's body, or the advance of tuberculosis. <laughs> My goodness. Many life-threatening diseases evoke auto-digestion and cause weight, cholesterol, glucose, insulin, and blood pressure to fall. They are all emphatically ill-advised just the same. So he's comparing the ketogenic diet creating damage like you would if you smoke crack or had cancer or had TB. And the last thing I want to bring up, just one last quote, as I write this, the proposed guiding principles for healthy eating in Canada have just been released. They are eminently sensible, current, and evidence-based, so naturally they are under immediate attack, as was the comparably sensible 2015 report of the Dietary Guideline Advisory Committee here in the U.S. before its ink was dry. All right, so definitely he's talking about how you know, there was some attack on this Dietary Guideline Advisory Committee. Well, if you take a look at this website called the usrighttoknow.org, nearly half of the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee have conflicts of interest. This is why it's attacked. So I'm not sure about Dr. Gill, but I definitely know Dr. Katz doesn't like keto. Now for me, what this whole video sort of highlights is that there's a lot of information out there. And sometimes us laymen don't know who to believe. I mean, Dr. Berg's putting forward some pretty compelling arguments with screenshots of articles and he's using a lot of big words. What's the quote from that movie, The 40-Year-Old Virgin? I'm going to take it as a sign of disrespect because you're using big words. But um, that's, the, that's the challenge with this online world that we live in. You don't know who to believe. You don't know what people's agenda are. I'm not saying Dr. Berg has an agenda. He's clearly saying this other guru has an agenda against his agenda, which is ketosis or keto diets. Yeah, I don't know. Who do you believe? What do you guys think? Let me know in the comments. 980 keto videos, which very unfortunately, well, he'll probably like this. It's You can't even find them anymore. When you do a search on keto, all you see is the negative keto videos that come up. But of course, if you search for the plant-based ones, they're all really nice and positive. So my question for Gil and others who do like an uh, anti-Dr. Berg videos is what diet do you recommend? You know, what should we be eating? And let's compare that versus just the ketogenic diet because there's a lot of different ketogenic diet versions. Uh, the one I recommend is the healthy version. In fact, I don't know if Gil knows this, but I recommend seven to 10 cups of vegetables every single day, which is a considerable amount of vegetables. I don't know if he knew that or not. But as I dug more into this true health initiative site, I found a link to this. I'll pay Dr. Berg credit for that. Eat he never says exclude uh, carbohydrates it's called the Eat or exclude the uh, healthy health fats or exclude diet. vegetables. So as far as I know, this might be the diet that there, this group recommends. I don't know this for a fact, but it's definitely mostly plant-based and they want to put this out to the I'm entire planet. So this is what it looks like, okay? Here's the, the interesting thing about this diet. They're recommending 811 calories, be whole grains, okay? What about gluten? What about the phytates, which block zinc? And what about the fact that very, very few people have just whole grains? They have a combination of whole grains and refined grains. I mean, just take a look at the grocery store. They do recommend potatoes and cassava, uh, fruits, 126 calories. But this is interesting. Beef, we can have 30 calories per day. That comes out to a half of an ounce per day. That's like a little, little tiny bite. But we can have 284 calories. It's like one of those little breakfast sausages, okay. little chipolatas. Nuts and 354 calories of unsaturated oils. Would that be like soy oil, canola oil, cottonseed oil, corn oil? I couldn't find the specific unsaturated fats. And that you're allowed added sugars, 120 calories. So that's 7.5 teaspoons per day. Now, why is that on the list of a planetary health diet? Why do you even have to add sugars? What is healthy about those added sugars? I would love to know. Now, another thing about that this is planetary weird. health diet is the strategic partners, okay? Yeah, partners. this Let's is corporations. That would be, well, we have Nestle. Yeah. That's interesting. Nestle produces a lot of um, refined foods at the grocery store, don't they? Why are they involved in this planetary health diet? That's that's strange. Well, I did a little deeper dive on veganews.com, and apparently Nestle is the first major food company to get behind lab-grown meat. Oh, Incredible. snap. Dr. Gill, if you're watching, Conspiracy. please you should be eating. And please educate us Conspiracy. on what you're about what I'm recommending and also what is so beneficial health-wise of what you're recommending. Now, because of the censoring and the suppressing of the algorithms on YouTube, it's becoming more difficult to find my content. 
and there's a lot of content that I cannot put on YouTube, unfortunately. So to make sure you have full access of all my information, go to drberg.com and subscribe to my... That YouTube last part sounded a little bit tin hatty. I will see you on the other side. I don't think anyone's censoring the algorithm. Anyway, hope you enjoyed my reaction video. See you on the next one.